moving right along, our next speaker is going to cover next uh, No Child Left Behind waiver and Title I. Aaron Tuttle is a Truth in American Education advocate and co-founder of, co of Hoosiers Against Common Core. She was recognized by Governor Mike Pence as a leader in the passage of legislation in the Indiana General Assembly which rejected the implementation of Common Core standards and testing. Please welcome Aaron Tuttle. So if you're parked in the back parking lot, please at go out lunch, and move your vehicle. At lunch time. Pardon? At no, lunch time. Right yeah, at lunch time. Um, and just to, to one more, just to add to what Dr. Lessig said about you know getting involved. Um, you know, really in Indiana it was while the end result wasn't what we wanted, you know, just it was a group of parents who got legislation passed to repeal Common Core. You know, we were just average, regular parents. Um, we just decided to take it on and start doing our own research. So uh, really and truly, the average citizen can make a big difference if they put their mind to it um, and have a thick skin. Um, so and the focus of what I'm going to talk about now feeds off what she was saying about test results and assessments. Um, in 2010, the United States Department of Education began offering states um, No Child Left Behind flexibility waivers to avoid compliance with certain requirements of the Elementary uh, and Secondary Education Act, as we, as they said earlier, uh, reauthorized in 2001, known as No Child Left Behind. Um, so in exchange for the waived provisions of No Child Left Behind, states have, have really essentially just accepted different federal requirements um, in regards to their academic standards, their assessments, differentiated school accountability measures, revised teacher evaluations, and it has changed you know, how they would intervene in their lowest performing schools. So um, this, the waivers have required a massive transformation of how state education agencies, local school districts, and teachers really go about doing their business. Um, and in my opinion, it will have really a, a damaging effect on the students and, and teachers in particular. So one would have to assume this is a little okay. Uh, one would have to assume there would be some kind of payoff for you know taking on these new federal requirements. You know you would have to think that there would be something advantageous to the state for doing so. But in reality, what they've done is simply exchanged one set of federal handcuffs for another set of federal handcuffs, and that are actually more restrictive than what they thought they were getting out of. And so to believe that, you know, your State Department of Ed would make such a bad deal, you know, it's hard to believe that, that they would do that um, without really understanding what it is that they escaped by accepting the waiver and who actually is going to be benefiting from it. Um, so if I asked anybody in this room who knows about this, the waivers, what, why they think the state needed it and what was, what was, what was the reasoning that was sold to them? They would say it's because of AYP. AYP is going to require every student in the state to be 100% proficient by 2013-14. And if that doesn't happen, you know, we're going to lose tons of Title I money. We're going to lose federal money. You know, they're going to start closing down schools. We're going to have to fire teachers. I mean, you, we, I've heard a million different reasons about what's going to happen. And it's like whatever calamity your superintendent chooses to make up. 
I mean, that's going to happen if you don't get the waiver and you have to meet that 100% proficiency rate. Um, but I would say that this fear is really based, I said this down, I'll make that buzz. Um, but this fear is, is really based um, on a misconception because no child left behind does not require states to actually meet this 100% target. Um, only to show a plan to attempt to do so and to take actionable steps to assist schools that don't meet that. Um, not making AYP will not affect the amount of federal funding a school receives. It will not. Um, thus, a state is not in violation of No Child Left Behind if students don't reach 100% um, proficiency. So accordingly, there can be no penalty to the state. Um, you know, certainly Congress never imagined that every student, you know, 100% regardless of English language proficiency levels, you know, learning disabilities, etc. I mean, they never imagined that 100% of them would meet this target, this eventual goal of 100% proficiency. But what they did intend to do was to leave no child left behind and set a high expectation for everybody. But certainly, it was never intended in the legislation that every single child would meet it. Um, it's just not, it's not probable. So if there's no actual federal penalty to the state for failing to make AYP, um, why is it that everybody wants, this, wants these waivers? Well, state education officials are highly cognizant of the negative appearance of a huge increase in the number of schools that will fail and that will start falling into that category, not making AYP. And they have predicted, you know, such an increase unless the waiver can come in, you know, to their rescue. Um, but why are states facing such an increase of schools that won't make AYP? You know, what's changing? Well, once the proficiency rate is changing. Um, but since, uh, is it me? Do I no, have like you're a talking plate right in my head that's... You're talking right under a speaker. Can you come over on this side? Oh, sure. Yeah, that's actually... Do you want the podium over there? No, it's okay. I can, uh, <coughs> the only thing is I have to switch this slide. Where, where am I? Where's the safe area? The speaker's right here. You need to be more over this way. Okay, let's do this. Can you move that that way? And then I'll just sneak around like this, and then I won't block it. Okay, so if you look up here, there, like since 2001, that's when No Child Left Behind began. And states were supposed to, you know, kind of show on a trajectory how they would meet 100% proficiency by 2013-14. Now this is from Kansas. Um, and what they've done is they, they've set fairly level increases, right, to get up to 100%. I mean, that's what you would assume everybody did. I mean, you would assume that would be a logical way to meet that proficiency level in that amount of time. But then if you look at what Indiana and a lot of other states, and many, many states did, right? They backloaded all the growth. Here, if you can see, this is, this is 2009, 2010. Now this is 2011. That's 50... Uh, can you guys read that very well? No? Okay, let me explain it. So this right here is the target. We're going to say that if we meet 56.8% proficiency, then we have met AYP. Now we're going to wait three years, and then we're going to bump it up to 65.7%. And if kids, if we have this percentage of children proficient, then if AYP has been met. And now we're going to wait another three years, and then we're going to bump it up to 72.6% proficiency rate. And if we meet that, we've made AYP. And then we're going to wait, and then in 2010, um, we're going to bump it up to 79, and the next year 86, and then the next year 93, and then the next year up to 100. So they're, they're expecting over half of the growth needed to reach 100% AYP target in 2013-14 to happen in the last three years. Um, when the majority of student growth is backloaded like that, schools making AYP before that time, before 2010, they could have been doing so with very minimal effort. You know, it wasn't hard, not that it isn't hard, 
but it's much less difficult to be making it when you're, when you're only gradually increasing it just a teeny little bit and then keeping it the same. But conversely, after 2010, it's going to be almost impossible then to make AYP without substantial gains on their proficiency target. Um, Chester Finn, who is president of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute, who I normally never quote, um, <laughs> if, you, if you know who I'm talking about, but he's president of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute, and he wrote back in 2003, he says, and I quote, what I think is going on, cynic though you may call me, is that clever folks in at least some of the states have figured out that by the time 2011 rolls <coughs> around, none of them will be responsible any longer. They'll all have moved on to new jobs, retired to their ranchettes, which I've never heard that word, ranchettes, blah, blah, blah. He goes on, he says, hence, the immense achievement gains being promised for those last three years of no child left behind will be somebody else's problem to deliver. The incumbent will, in effect, have sold the property before the balloon part of the mortgage hits. And that's exactly what's happened. So this sets a stage. So, you know, it, it, you know, obviously his prophecy, you know, has been realized, but it doesn't seem that state officials are, that are currently in office are being forthcoming about what it is or what they have not been doing um, throughout the years. And that the reason for an increased number of schools that won't make the AYP proficiency targets in last year's leading up to the deadline isn't anything somebody wasn't expecting there. Um, not, not all states have done this kind of backloading, but the majority of them have done so. Um, skip along here. Um, and you know what? What a perfect time for a waiver to come along. <laughs> you know, here we are, 2009, 2010. People are sitting in state departments of ed, you know, sweating. What are we going to do? You know, we're going to get exposed. Not only are we not able to make 100%, I mean, we're barely at 72 you know, they don't want to have as much detail and scrutiny on what has been going on and what they should have been doing. Um, so that more, or the mortgage, I just read the wrong word. Um, so that waiver, I mean, sounding really attractive to them. And they are willing to do things that maybe they shouldn't do as far as teacher evaluations, the standards, um, the assessments, you know, how they're measuring their schools, how they're, you know, doing their differentiated accountability. That just seemed a whole lot more acceptable to them. Because what they're going to be able to do is, you know, avoid exposing that. Um, so, if that isn't bad enough, the backloading of the, of the growth, um, there's also another numbers game going on. I mean, it's incredible gamesmanship in, in reflecting accurately the success of schools and their children's performance on assessments. So, you know, it's not bad enough. There's one, um, there's another little game that they play, and it's called a confidence interval. So let's say that you were doing a poll, and you surveyed 50 people from York. And you call them York Yorkers? <laughs> Yorksters? Yorkers. And you, and you ask them if they like eggs. And 70% of them, and 70% said, yes, I do, I like eggs, then you might easily be able to, or you might be able to say, not easily, but you might be able to say that 70% of York residents like eggs. But you would have to qualify that, and you would have to include probably a 15-point margin of error, right? Because you only surveyed 50 of them. So you might have to say, well, based on my survey, I could tell you that between 55 and 85% of Yorksters like eggs. Now, conversely, or let's say that you had asked 10,000 York residents, do you like eggs? And your answer is 70%. Well, this has a greater likelihood of being accurate, right? Because you've asked more people. And so you wouldn't have to use a large margin of error on your result. You could say, okay, based, because I've asked so many people and 70% said they like eggs, I could probably say between 65 to 75% like eggs. Because there's always room for, you know, some error. Um, but margins of error can also change. So here's your one thing. Group size affects how big of a margin of error you have to use. The second thing is how confident you are that that result is accurate. If I say I am 99% accurate, that there is only a 1% chance that 
Camera's wrong to <laughs> Is there any way to make that more? I'm just going to mess that up. 
Um, so here's for your larger groups. There's your, so, so here's the percentage rates, right? And here's the years going along the way, back when we started in 2002. Now, it was expected, it started at 58 or 56.8%, right? But the lowest groups could score 40. Now, look what happens here. Here's what it was required in the beginning, 58.8%. Now, we could be as far as 2008, and your lowest groups are only at 55.8%. After six years, your smallest performing subgroups aren't even where the target began. I mean, and I'm not saying this is every group and every student, but this is something that has been acceptable. So when you're the State Department of Ed, and you've got this looming over here, in 2009, 2010, they're talking about the waivers, and you've got people down here, and people think they're up there, how are you ever going to get them from there to there? I mean, the whole thing gets opened up. Um, so what do they need to do? They've got the waivers coming along, and they say, we need to just hit the reset button. I mean, what, what else can you do with that mess on that graph? There, there's not a lot of options. You just need to simply say, we got to have a redo, take a mulligan, or, or whatever they call it. Um, so under the waiver, the SEAs can essentially, you know, press the reset button, establish new annual objectives. So no longer AYP is gone. You get a waiver, we are going to judge you on whether or not you're making AYP. We're going to let you guys create some new, you know, annual objective measures to which you can hold your schools accountable. And I'll tell you one thing that's going away with that is the assessment scores are, are being devalued. What they want to do is count student growth. And I don't know what the model is in New Hampshire and Maine. But in Indiana, it's not your child's growth year to year. It's your child's growth based on other students who scored the same low grade or whatever grade the, last, the previous year. And whatever growth was expected from, that, from a similar group of students that had the same assessment score, then they're going to judge your student against that. And that will determine their growth. And I still, in my, I still am having a hard time wrapping my mind around why that makes sense to anybody. If you want to judge a student on their growth, judge it on that student's growth year to year. Um, okay. So with the waiver, what it kind of allows them to do is kind of continue some of this deception that's been going on and mask a lot of failures to, to make improvements and all along. So the second thing, and I'm, how much time do I have? Where's that? Five? Okay, I have one. Okay, so does the, you know, when you, when states accepted a waiver, they changed their assessments, they changed their teacher evaluations, they changed their standards, they changed how they would grade their schools, they changed a whole lot of things based on and according to how the U.S. Department of Education wanted them to do that. It is their agenda being implemented in state policy by the use of the No Child Left Behind waivers. So is that even a legal thing? Is that even something that the U.S. Department of Education has the authority to do? And it's been criticized heavily for its use of grants and waivers uh, to dictate education policy to the states. So No Child Left Behind legislation does give, it does give the Secretary of Education the authority to grant waivers from No Child Left Behind's accountability provisions. It requires the states to justify how a proposed waiver would increase, and I'm quoting from the legislation, increase the quality of instruction and improve the academic achievement of students. The waiver scheme, that I'm calling it a scheme, um, however, far exceeds that, that is included in the legislation. So with the No Child Left Behind waivers, the U.S. Department of Ed has dictated a host of conditions not allowed in the legislation. Uh, with which states would have to comply to receive a waiver, and that is because Ed does not have the authority over which methods states use to improve their instruction, um, which is cited in the legislation. Um, but unfortunately, you know, a state would have to challenge this assumed authority, and you just don't have many people in state departments of education or governors of states who are, willing to, who are ready to stand up and say, you know what? Thanks so much for the waiver, but we aren't doing it like that. We're doing it our way. You know, we don't have to do it this way. We have the legal authority to do it the way that we want to do it, and you can't remove any funding for us if we do so. But um, it seems those conversations are, are not being had. 
Here's a good example, then I'll end. Um, so Arnie Duncan <laughs> placed Indiana's waiver on conditional status uh, because the student assessment Indiana was using was supposedly, it didn't meet the new federal requirement mandated by the waiver to have a college and career ready assessment. They said your, your, your ISEP assessment that your state legislator is mandating you use next year isn't fitting our requirement. And if you don't fix that, we're going to take away your waiver. So that's replacing federal policy or replacing state policy, state law, with the desires of the U.S. Department of Education. So um, Indiana Superintendent of Education, Glenda Ritz, and I helped get her elected because I hated the Tony Bennett, who was the superintendent that she uh, actually replaced. Unfortunately, she's she's tending she's she's fallen off her uh, or she's fallen into the whole trap. But um, she publicly stated, Indiana must change the state assessment I step required by state law to be given in 2014-15 to include specific types of test items required by the U.S. Department of Education. Failure to do so, she warned. Uh, would cause Indiana's waiver to be revoked. So no matter how willing Superintendent Ritz is, you know, to be bullied by uh, Arnie Duncan, the truth is is that she isn't required to do so under ESCA legislation, no child left behind. Um, and I'll just, you know, give you the facts. Section 1111 of uh, subsection F provides that, and I quote, the secretary shall not have the authority to require a state as a condition of approval of the state plan to include in or delete from such plan one or more specific elements of the state's academic content standards or to use specific academic assessment instruments or items. So that's in the law. And, and you have Arnie Duncan telling Indiana, you have to change your assessment and include college and career ready instruments, assessment instruments, which he's not allowed to do. But no one's saying anything about it. They just cower down and they're just doing it. And so, you know, there's a need for people, one, to be educated on stuff like this, because I don't even know if people within the Indiana Department of Education have read this legislation for a while. You know, it seems like they accept the word of the guy that held the position three years earlier, and that's what they said we had to do, and so that's what we're doing it. But has anybody ever gone back and checked that for the last, you know, seven, eight, ten years to see what it actually says in law that we can or we cannot do? And so there's a need for that. Um, and I'll end there because I don't want to go too long. Thanks, guys. Thank you.